Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics on some of our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and we'll be doing something a bit different today. Rather than going into the details of a single dinosaur genus, we will be exploring an entire family of dinosaurs, including a variety of different genus. Thank you to Lemon Lydia for today's topic, the Hadrosaurs. The Hadrosaurs, or Hadrosauridae, are one of the oldest dinosaur families in paleontological history, so we're going to have to start all the way back in 1854, a time defined by violence from the Crimean War and Bleeding Kansas, as well as questionable fashion, where dressing up as a fancy lampshade was still considered normal. It was during this time that paleontologist Ferdinand van de Veer Hayden would identify the first dinosaur fossils in North America, as well as the first hadrosaur to ever be recognized. These original fossils were discovered in the modern-day United States, specifically the state of Montana near the Judith River. These fossils, recovered by paleontologist Joseph Leedy, consisted of several teeth, fingers, and other bones that belonged to two particular genus, the Trachodon and the Species. While the Trachodon fossils would later be redetermined to belong to a ceratopsid rather than a hadrosaur, Trachodon would have the honor as the first named hadrosaur in history. This does not make it the first hadrosaur member, however, as the family Hadrosauridae was not yet recognized at the time, and instead, Trachodon was identified as a generic Ornithischian. This honor would go to another genus, the Hadrosaurus, discovered in 1858 and described in 1865 by Leedy. With its description, the Hadrosauridae was first established by famed paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope in 1869, containing only the Hadrosaurus. Over the next 50 years, various foundational hypotheses would be proposed for the family, including their belief to be semi-aquatic, as well as the belief that their teeth were fragile and jaws fairly weak. However, crucially, these beliefs were based on sketchy specimens, like the previously mentioned Trachodon, who is now believed to be a nomen dubium, or doubtful to even exist, and other remains often being fragmentary or limited to only teeth. This would change in 1908, when fossil collector Charles Hazelius Sternberg would recover a remarkably complete specimen of an Edmontosaurus, so complete that paleontologist Henry Osborne would dub the specimen the Dinosaur Mummy, and even skin impressions were still visible in the rock surrounding it. This specimen would give one of the most complete pictures as to what a hadrosaur would look like and bring more attention to the family as a whole. An example of this attention would be in the crucial work Hadrosaurian Dinosaurs of North America, written by Richard Swan Lowell and Nelda Wright in 1942. This piece was meant to stand as the definitive work for the hadrosaur family, providing insights into the past of the family and its members, as well as drawing conclusions based on modern, to the time, research. While this work would support the idea that hadrosaurs were semi-aquatic, they would argue previous beliefs that hadrosaurs had weak teeth and jaws. Instead, they argued that their jaws were actually quite powerful, lined with rows of batteries capable of grinding any vegetation, and containing thousands of teeth, ready to replace dulled ones as needed. Nearly 20 years later, paleontologist John Ostrom would publish another work, arguing the validity of another long-held belief, this time the belief that hadrosaurs were semi-aquatic. Ostrom argued that various factors, including their environment, anatomy, and fossil evidence, all suggested that actual evidence of a majority aquatic life was lacking, and instead, hadrosaurs were more than capable of thriving on land. However, 
Ostrom would concede that it is possible that hadrosaurs could utilize water for some source of food and for escaping predators, due to webbing on their feet as well as their long paddle-like tails. The 2000s would bring on an almost renaissance in hadrosaur research. Events like the 2001 International Hadrosaur Symposium, which yes, is a thing, as well as the advent of the internet has allowed for better organization and research findings, as well as more opportunities to research topics like biogeography and growth. The Hadrosauridae was named after its founding member, the Hadrosaurus, and stems from Latin, specifically Hadros, meaning thick or bulky, and Soros for lizard, translating to uh, a heavy or bulky lizard. This name references the massive bodies members of this group were able to achieve. The Hadrosaurus was a member of the Ornithischian group, one of the two main divisions of dinosaurs named for their bird-like hips. As for the family itself, Hadrosaurs are often divided into two main subfamilies, the Lambiosaurinae and the Saurolophinae. The Lambiosaurinae are most easily recognized by their ornate crests atop their skulls, most likely used for communication and display. Members of this subfamily include previous Dinobasic entries, Parasaurolophus and Corythosaurus. The Saurolophinae, in contrast, are often just called the crestless hadrosaurs, as their members are very similar in body shape to Lambiosaurinae members, except for their crests. Popular members of this family include dinosaurs like the Myasaura and the Edmontosaurus. Also, for those wondering, the type species Hadrosaurus doesn't actually fall under either of these subfamilies. Instead, it is often placed above these subfamilies, way up here. Due to the genus being more primitive than other Saurolophinae or Lambiosaurinae members, as well as a lack of consensus among paleontologists, if it should belong to either. Matured Hadrosaurs were some of the largest Ornithischians to ever live, outsizing other giant dinosaurs like the Triceratops and Stegosaurus. The average hadrosaur would have been 30 feet or 9 meters long, and stood 10 feet or 3 meters tall. They averaged out at about 3 tons, the same weight as a white rhinoceros. However, some of its largest members, like the Chatungosaurus, could have reached up to 50 feet or 15 meters long, and weighed up to 15 tons. This size would be their main defense, as while they lacked heavy armor or spiked weaponry, many hadrosaurs at full size could outgrow many smaller carnivores and match apex predators in size and body weight. This was not their only defense, however. Hadrosaurs were faculative bipeds, meaning they would naturally walk on all fours, but were capable of running on their back legs to reach greater speeds. Most hadrosaurs could reach up to 28 miles per hour, almost 10 miles an hour faster than most large carnivores like the Tyrannosaurus rex. A final defense would be their brains, as hadrosaurs had some of the most complex brains among Ornithischians. While their brains were proportionally small compared to their bodies, Paleontologist James Hobson noted the complexity of various hadrosaurs, particularly compared to earlier relatives like the Iguanodon and Camptosaurus. Their intelligence was even considered comparable to modern-day crocodilians. This certainly wouldn't have made them math prodigies, but this boosted intelligence suggested they would have had more acute senses of smell and sight to avoid predators as well as allowing for more complex communication between members of their own kind, which would have been crucial for acoustic Lambiosaurinae. Hadrosaurs are probably most recognizable for their distinctive mouths. So much so that the hadrosaurs are sometimes called the duck-billed dinosaurs. While this name is certainly iconic, it is not very representative of the family. 
While the general shape of the jaws were somewhat mallard beak shaped, much of this jaw was flesh and bone and only ended in a keratinous beak, which often decayed in the fossilization process. Many hadrosaurs often had their jaws end in a more blunted shape, more similar to a shovel than a duck. These jaws were very powerful, lined with thousands of teeth, ideal for grinding vegetation before swallowing. The main food source of hadrosaurs were originally thought to be soft, aquatic plants under the water, but later evidence has made it clear that hadrosaurs were more than capable of breaking down tough terrestrial vegetation. In fact, these jaws were believed to be the main reason for the family's dominance in the Cretaceous period. Speaking of recognizable, another commonly associated trait of hadrosaurs is their nesting habits and raising of young. Various hadrosaurs, including Edmontosaurus and Myasaura, had fossil evidence of organizing into large colonies and raising their young until they were old enough to care for themselves. So well associated, in fact, that Myasaura translates to good mother lizard from Latin. These beliefs are certainly accurate, as nests of hadrosaurs have been found across Asia and North America. These nests were bowl-shaped structures in the ground containing about 20 eggs. An adult, most likely the mother, would then watch over the nest to protect from predators and bring food to the nest to feed hatchlings. While accurate, it is not necessarily unique to hatchosaurs. Nesting in colonies has been discovered for sauropods as well as theropods, and it is believed many dinosaurs, carnivores and herbivores, were devoted parents, feeding and protecting their young until they matured. Hadrosaurs would have lived across Asia, Europe, and North America. The earliest hadrosaurs appeared in the early Cretaceous, almost 120 million years ago. They are believed to be the descendants of another group of Ornithischians known as the Iguanodontia, including members like the Iguanodon. During this time, sauropods were still the most common group of dinosaurs, but moving into the late Cretaceous, hadrosaurs would take their place as the most common and successful group of dinosaurs, with some scientists referring to hadrosaurs as the sheep of the Mesozoic. This success can largely be attributed to their eating habits, as their powerful jaws, thousands of teeth, and efficient digestive systems made them capable of eating a wide range of plants in vast quantities. Despite their success in the past, today, hadrosaurs rarely shine as individuals in pop culture appearances. Often, their portrayals are limited to being background extras or mere fodder for larger carnivores to show their own strength. The few members have been able to strike out with their own starring roles including members like Myasaura in the 2003 documentary Dinosaur Planet, Edmontosaurus with documentary roles like 2011's March of the Dinosaurs, and 2022's Prehistoric Planet, Parasaurolophus being featured as the character Dweeb in the 1993 movie We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, as well as being a recurring character in the 2005 television show Dinosaur King, and Carithosaurus as... N n never mind, Carithosaurus has no starring roles. The current portrayal of Hadrosaurus as defenseless fodder to simply fill out the background is truly disrespectful to what Hadrosaurus were in their time. The Hadrosaurs were not only one of the most successful herbivores, but possibly some of the most successful dinosaurs of all time. Their unique adaptations, towering sizes, and fascinating behavior make them standout members of the dinosaurs. And I'd say it's about time they had their time in the sun. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of the Hadrosaurus, and if you have any favorite members in particular. 
I would also love to hear what you guys think of this focus on families rather than individuals. And who knows, we may be exploring these kind of topics more in the future. Or maybe not, and this will just be a weird outlier in the series. Next Friday, we'll be exploring the ravenous Delta Dromius. But that isn't our next episode. Stay tuned for Friday for a little Halloween treat. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.